I am Dr. Danny Nguyen with City of Hope, Orange County. I practice out of our Irvine and Huntington Beach offices. At, at ESVO this year, uh, in the EGFR X120 space, there was predominantly three uh, drugs that were presented. Uh, Amavantamab, uh, which got approval uh, in the United States this year. Uh, Mobocertinib, which also just got approval last week, um, as well as DZD9008. Uh, Yeah, I guess I'll start with mobile surinib. Um, so they presented that their, their overall, in the prior platinum um, cohort, their overall response rate is 28% with a median PFS of 7.3 months. Um, and I think what's impressive is their median duration of response of 17.5 months. Um, in total, their clinical benefit rate was 78%. Um, so uh, I think they, um, there was also some other abstracts early in the year showing that patients who had prior EGFR TKIs, about 20, any, anywhere between 20 to 40% of those patients also responded to mobocertinib. And those prior EGFR TKIs included osimertinib, afatinib, uh, and poziotinib as well. Um, also of note was that um, baseline brain metastasis represented 35% of these patients. Um, and um, overall response rates were seem, um, seemingly lower in patients with brain, uh, baseline brain metastasis at 17.5 months versus 33.8 months. Um, amivantamab uh, demonstrated an overall response rate of 40%. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, they also uh, uh, reported 4% um, CR rates as well. Um, the median duration of response was 11.1 months uh, with a clinical benefit of 74%. Um, of note also uh, in their cohort, they had only 22% of their patients having uh, brain metastasis, but they did represent, um, uh, but they did demonstrate an overall response rate of about 39%. So it seems like uh, patients on amivantamab with brain metastasis um, benefit just a little bit uh, more than mobocertinib, but patients on mobocertinib had a longer median duration of response. So I, I think there's, I think there's um, room for both of these agents in the management of, of these patients. Likely any EGFR Exxon 20 patient throughout their lifetime will be on both drugs. Um, also presented uh, was DZ, the results of DZD9008, um, also an oral EGFR, uh, EGFR Exxon 20 um, TKI. Um, their overall response rates were similar to the prior two of 41%. Um, stable disease in 48% with the disease control rate of 90%. Um, over 40% of these patients had baseline brain metastasis, and they also appeared to also benefit from, um, from this medication. Um, also of note is that two patients who had prior received uh, amivantamab had also uh, responded to DZD9008. So um, when it comes to sequencing, um, perhaps this medication um, can be used after amivantamab. There was a, another abstract that, that showed that um, uh, patients who had prior received immunotherapy also um, seemed to have benefit. It didn't seem to influence the benefit of, of um, patients getting mobocertinib. So the, actually, they did have a lot of real world, world data uh, presented at World Lung and um, ESMO. Um, I think in general, the, the current treatment options for, well, actually before this year, the current treatment options for each of our XM20 patients was mostly chemotherapy, plus or minus immunotherapy, uh, and plus or minus bevacizumab. Um, I think that when uh, patients were treated with immunotherapy in general for these um, um, for this type of mutation, uh, patients weren't on therapy for as long. Um, and in general, those patients uh, needed to go on to second and third line uh, therapy sooner. Um, and overall, their, um, their overall survival was um, a lot shorter. Um, with the advent of these medications, there was a significant improvement in, in all those parameters. Um, so I think that was the, the main takeaway from, from, that, um, from that abstract.
I think the, the abstracts that had the most data on managing the side effects were uh, mostly surrounding uh, mobocertinib. Um, and again, um, the, to talk about the side effect profile of, of, um, of mobocertinib, it's been pretty well characterized, um, consistent with other EGFR Exxon um, 20, or actually um, consistent with other EGFR TKIs in general. Um, there was um, side effects including diarrhea, which include uh, which involved more than 93% of patients, uh, as well as uh, uh, rash, which um, involved more than 45% of patients. Um, in general, these side effects were mostly grade one and grade two, um, and uh, very manageable as well. Um, all grades, um, uh, sorry, grade three and grade four uh, diarrhea uh, was um, in, occurred in 22% of patients and serious uh, diarrhea um, occurred in 8%. 11% um, of patients had to have a dose reduction um, and only 4% had to actually discontinue um, from the medication. Um, nausea and vomiting also led to dose um, um, uh, drug discontinuation in four and 2% respectively. Um, so when it comes to managing the, the patients with uh, these GI toxicities, uh, I think there's some things that the physician can do, and then there's some things that the patients can do. Um, in, in regards to the physicians, um, since we know that so many patients go um, and get a diarrhea um, uh, from the medication, I, I, I like to send the patients home with um, a prescription of uh, Imodium or some other anti-motility um, agent. Um, and I instruct them that whenever uh, there's any change in their bowel movements um, to, to start taking the medication immediately. Um, and then when that happens, I like to uh, keep track of the patients a lot closer because um, oftentimes if the diarrhea isn't managed with just the single uh, agent, um, uh, anti-motility agent, they may need additional uh, other medications like uh, Lamotil. Um, and in, in severe cases, they may need um, octreotide or, or other um, uh, heroic measures. Um, and also reassessing the patients um, constantly for the need for um, hydration. Um, because these patients can get severely dehydrated really quickly uh, from the diarrhea. Um, from the patient side, I, I think there are some strategies that they can, um, um, can utilize. Uh, sometimes they, patients notice that if they take the medication at different times during the day, uh, that might make uh, the diarrhea, um, for some reason that might influence their diarrhea. Um, in addition, certain foods uh, trigger uh, diarrhea for some of these patients. So um, instructing them to identify which foods trigger their diarrhea symptoms and avoiding them, uh, which seem to make sense. Um, and at the end of the day, if, you know, if you do, if the physician does all their, um, uh, their measures and the patients do what they can, sometimes you just need to hold the medication until the symptoms recover. And um, fortunately, um, um, the, the characterization, um, characterization of the uh, time to resolution um, for, for, for these patients. Uh, typically, this, uh, patients resolve their diarrhea uh, within two days for the grade one and two, and uh, typically about 6.5 days for the grade three diarrheas. Um, so uh, I, I think the, the data surrounding um, GI toxicities and, and, uh, and other toxicities with mobocertinib was, was, was a little bit more robust um, for mobocertinib. Um, just to also mention that uh, there was also an abstract regarding uh, characterization, uh, characterization of skin toxicities uh, at ESBO as well. And again, um, uh, many of these patients um, had manageable uh, rash and a lot of them were just managed with um, uh, topical steroids. Um, and sometimes what I'll use also oral um, antibiotics like doxycycline or minocycline. Um, and topical antibiotics um, also helps. And for the really severe rashes, um, oral steroids are sometimes uh, necessary. Some other patient factors that I've found um, that helps uh, manage the rash as well as, you know, instructing patients to use uh, a lot of moisturizing lotion, um, uh, uh, sometimes also avoiding um, as much sun as possible seems to help too. Um, sometimes um, these patients develop like a photosensitivity as well.
so in, in regards to the other data, uh, I don't think amivantamab had as much in terms of managing their, their side effects, but you know, amivantamab uh, is a different class of drug uh, as opposed to mobocertinib and the other oral TKIs. Um, being a monoclonal antibody, um, as well as you know, our experience with other monoclonal antibodies, they had more of an infusion reaction um, type of um, side effect to watch out for. 64% um, of patients had an infusion type reaction um, that quickly got better after um, starting around the second and third um, infusions. Um, and uh, they had a, a very nice protocol in terms of managing the infusion reaction as it happens. 84% um, of patients had a rash with only 4% of those patients having a grade three or four rash. 16% of patients had diarrhea and 36% of patients had nausea. Um, uh, also for, for, for them, they had 15% um, uh, of patients have a dose reduction due to an AE and 11% of patients had, a, um, had to discontinue their, their medication due to an AE. Takeda also presented some data at World Conference on Lung Cancer this month, uh, demonstrating that patient quality of life was maintained while they were on mobocertinib. Um, I think key things was that uh, patient um, cancer symptoms, which included dyspnea, coughing, and chest pain, had significantly improved. Um, this was despite them um, um, noting worsened um, symptoms, including diarrhea and, and rash. So um, to me, this represents that patients were willing to deal with a little bit of the adverse reactions um, in the diarrhea and rash if they felt like their cancer symptoms were, uh, were improving. So I think the future it looks very bright actually for each of our X120 patients. Um, so um, I just mentioned that the amivantamab was approved this year, as well as mobocertinib getting approval last week. Um, I don't think we're done with those medications just yet. Um, I uh, I know that uh, amivantamab as well as mobocertinib are looking at other ways to improve their efficacy. Um, uh, in, um, um, uh, such as combining with uh, chemotherapy, um, which seems like a promising option as well. Um, and I think so far um, uh, the, that data hasn't been presented just yet, um, but I think we're gonna see it at some point. Um, and if we were to go look at the Egypt for X119 and 21 space, um, perhaps combining amabantamab with another EGFR X120 specific TKI would make sense um, at some point. So, um, and then we talked about DZD 9008 showing promising efficacy. Um, and I like the fact that they included so many patients with baseline brain metastasis, because um, that's an, an important consideration for these patients. Uh, many of these patients will progress in the CNS. So uh, identifying a medication that can, uh, uh, that can uh, get into the CNS as well as be tolerable um, is very beneficial for these patients. So some other treatment options that are uh, also coming in the works, um, coming down the line, um, is a drug uh, called CLN081. Um, very encouraging data uh, presented at ASCO this year. Um, um, they reported a 50% overall response rate with stable disease in 45% of these patients. Disease control rate at, of, of more than six months was at 68%. Um, those, uh, the trial also had some data um, for, on patients who received prior poseotinib and mobocertinib, and some of them did appear to benefit from being on CL CLN081. So um, I, I, honestly, I think, and the side effect profile seems to be very similar to mobocertinib and other uh, exon 20 TKIs, uh, but it seems to be a lot less and, um, and a lot less of the grade three toxicities as well. So I think this is gonna be a very promising uh, uh, medication to keep your eye on for the future. Um, some other medications includes uh, BDTX189. Um, they also presented some preliminary data at ASCO and um, it seems to be a very well-tolerated drug and seems to show some early signs of efficacy in the uh, Exxon 20 space as well. Two medications that um, I have my eye on also are uh, ones uh, from Bayer uh, 2476568, uh, uh, as well as uh, ORIC114. Um, 
these medications uh, seem to be promising and that they're showing some preclinical signs of CNS uh, efficacy as well. And that the, the Bayer compounds uh, unique to the other TKIs in that it's a reversible inhibitor. Um, so hopefully that, that might help overcome some of the challenges for these patients that become resistant in the future. So I, I want to make sure that patients as well as clinicians are aware that there's a large international support group um, headed by Marsha Horn called the Exxon 20 Group. Um, their website is exxon20group.org. Um, they're actually the, um, the lead advocacy organization designated by Janssen and Takeda for this particular disease. Um, they have many resources for these patients and a lot of um, uh, patients will get connected for with a patient this, this going through the same thing that they're going through. And they can also uh, a lot of times provide some uh, extra uh, resources for, um, for instance, managing some of the side effects uh, of being on these um, special medications as well. Thank <music> you.